But when I was confronted with the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit some years later, the great barrier between me and Christ was not my carnal sins. It was yoga. And I could not break through that mental barrier. God had to do a miracle of deliverance. The first deliverance service I was ever in, there was only one person there awake and one person asleep. There was another soldier asleep, and I was awake and on the middle of the floor, and God gave me, tell you, what you've seen in deliverance here is nothing beyond, beyond what I received then. And I never knew about deliverance. I didn't know about demons, but I wanted to come to Jesus. And I could not reach him till that yoga demon had lost its power over my mind. You can theorize, friend, but I was there. I know what it's like. It's one of a thousand different ways of being deceived into the territory of Satan and becoming enslaved. Now, I'm going to give you some Old Testament scriptures on this. Turn to the book of Exodus, the 20th chapter, verses 3 through 5. This is part of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now, what I want to point out to you is that if you seek for supernatural help and counsel and power from any other being but the true God, you make that being your God, the one to whom you seek. For supernatural help and revelation and power is your God. And these words apply to every person who's involved in that list, which I'm going to read to you in a moment. They have had some other God before the true God. They've allowed another God to come before the true God. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. And many people are bowing down and serving alien gods today in the form of horoscopes, Ouija boards, and other such things. They're in this category. And I want us, you to see the particular judgment that's pronounced upon them if they do not repent. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. This can bring a curse not only upon you, but on the succeeding three generations in your family. It's not any form of sin. It's this particular sin of having some other God. So if you have in your background a Christian science practi practitioner, somebody that believed in unity, a fortune teller, a medium, or any of these things, you are quite probably in some measure under a curse. And in many cases, your deliverance will not come until you revoke in Jesus' name the curse that comes from your background. I have proved this conclusively to my own satisfaction in ministering to people. There are times when you cannot get the person delivered simply on the basis of what they are and have done themselves. It's their inheritance spiritually coming down to them from someone that crossed the wrong border and gone into the wrong realm. God says it will be visited upon their children under the third and fourth generation. And it is. I'm not preaching condemnation. I'm opening your eyes. First of all, if you do it, you're bringing it on your children. Secondly, if your parents or grandparents or great-grandparents did it, you may still be suffering from their judgment. And you've got to learn how to get out from under that judgment. Thank God the curse is cancelled in Christ. But you better know where the curse is, and in many cases you have to know where it came from. All right, Deuteron Exodus 22. Exodus 22, verses 18, 19, and 20. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Whosoever lieth with a beast sexually shall be put to death. He that sacrifices unto any other god save the Lord only, he shall be utterly destroyed. You notice the company that the witch is put in, the one that sacrifices to another god or lies sexually with an animal. Not pleasant company to be in. Before we go any further, let's take these words that are on the blackboard. They're the ones used 
in the King James Version, and most of them do not have much meaning for modern Americans. Let's look at them. I'm trying to give you the modern English equivalent of these words, so that when you read them in another moment, you'll know what you're reading about. Divination is specifically fortune-telling. Observing times is horoscopes. This is a good week to do business, or whatever it may be. This is observing times, choosing the right time by the study of the heavenly bodies for certain specific courses of action. Astrology or stargazer, that's of course astrology. Having a familiar spirit, that's a word for a medium. A medium has a spirit that comes regularly to him, called his guide, or some other word like that. This is old. It's not new. You find it in almost all pagan countries. But in modern America, it's normally called a medium. Necromancy is seeking to the dead for advice and counsel. A charmer is one who uses charms for protection and so on. In Africa, we discovered, praying with the Africans for salvation, many times you would have to discern that the woman had charms around her waist and tell her to go off and take them away before you could bring her to salvation. None of these things are new. Enchanter is one who uses incantation, or more generally, music. Music has tremendous power, and Satan often uses it to enslave people. A wizard is a male and a witch is a female. All right. Now then, let's go through these other scriptures and then I'll go on further. But remember now the meaning of these words. Uh, let's turn to Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18. Verses 9 through 14. This is really the main list. Here's the whole works given you. Deuteronomy 18, verse 9, I'll read through verse 12. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. That is, offering your firstborn as a living sacrifice to be burned by fire in sacrifice to a pagan god. Notice this is in direct company with all these other activities. They're all put on the same level. Or that uses divination, fortune telling, or observer of times, horoscope, or an enchanter, or a witch, I'll give you a definition of witchcraft in a moment, or a charmer, or a consultant with familiar spirits, one that goes to a medium, or a wizard that's a male witch, or a necromancer, one that consults the day. There you are. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the law. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. All that do these things are an abomination unto the law. And we turn to Isaiah for a moment, 47th chapter of Isaiah. And just notice the picture of Babylon and the reason why God's judgment came on Babylon. And remember that there is to be a spiritual Babylon that comes forth at the close of this age, which is the spiritual counterpart of the Old Testament Babylon and has the same traits and characteristics. And in Isaiah 47, verses 12 and 13, you see the central feature of Babylonian religion. Stand now with thine enchantments and with the multitude of thy sorceries, wherein thou hast labored from thy youth. If so be, thou shalt be able to profit. If so be, thou mayest prevail. Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee, and so on. Notice, astrology, stargazing, monthly prognostication, that's horoscopes, Sorcery, these are the marks of Babylon. <coughs> you know there are only going to be two religious groups in Christendom at the end of the age. Do you know that? One's going to be the bride, the other's going to be the harlot. The bride will be marked by the fact that those in the bride have remained true to their commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, the bridegroom. The harlot will consist of those who have been seduced by deceiving spirits from their loyalty to Jesus Christ, and they will be marked with all the features of Babylonian religion here described, and you can read about them in the 17th and 18th chapters of the book of Revelation. Every one of us in this room 
is liable to be confronted by the decision, do I want to be in the bride or do I want to be in the harlot? And I don't believe there'll be a third choice. Now let's look at these words here. The three common words that are normally used are divination, witchcraft, and sorcery. And many, many times I have encountered these spirits that have spoken to me, defied me, and challenged me out of people. Those of you who were here yesterday afternoon remained for the deliverance service. There was more than one spirit of witchcraft that manifested itself and one that deliberately challenged me. As a matter of fact, I have a kind of private war with witchcraft. Many times they'll say to me, I know you. One said to me, why did you have to come? <laughs> All right, divination is essentially getting revelation by supernatural means, not through the Holy Spirit. Revelation of the past, revelation of where lost things are, revelation of who committed a crime, or prediction concerning the future. And I would say in modern language ESP, extrasensory perception, is all a manifestation of divination. I was praying with a woman in a church in Chicago, and she had been a medium. And the first time she came, I refused to pray with her, because I said, I don't believe you've repented. Second time she came, told me that she had repented. I questioned it, but I said I would pray with her. And I began to command the spirits to come out of her, and various spirits came out. And then I took a little rest, and I was just leaning against the altar rail of the church, and the woman was standing there by me, and she suddenly turned to me and said this, I see you in a car, and it's wrecked against a tree. And I said, you spirit of divination, I refuse to accept that from you. I'll not be in any car that's wrecked in any tree. But you see, if I had not been on my guard, had I begun to believe that, which was the spirit of divination speaking through her, it was describing Satan's destiny for me. And had I begun to believe it and think about it, I would have submitted myself to Satan's destiny in my life, and quite likely I would have ended up in a car wreck. Many, many people go to the fortune teller. You're going to divorce your husband and marry another man. They submit to it, and it happens. What you've done in that is submit to Satan's destiny planned for your life. You know about Harold Bredesen? How many of you know Harold Bredesen? I'm sure many of you do. You know when he went to a church that he was pastoring in New Jersey? It was a very modernistic liberal church and they'd organized a bazaar. So he thought, well, can't stop this now, I better go along with it. Then they told him, we're going to have a fortune teller. And his heart sank, but he thought, well, oh, I can't stop it right now. So he ended up by allowing the fortune teller and going to the fortune teller. Now this was all intended to be a joke, nothing else. As he sat there and looked at that fortune teller, she looked him in the eyes and said, your wife is going to have cancer. And he said, I realized that was Satan's voice telling me Satan's prediction for my wife. And his wife got cancer, but was healed. How many people have told me, I went to the fortune teller just for a joke. You know what Dennis Bennett says? Like counting the tiger's teeth just for a joke. Whether you did it for a joke or not is irrelevant. You went to a servant of Satan for help that you should receive only from God. And in doing that, you submitted yourself to Satan. You made Satan your God. That's the truth. Witchcraft operates primarily by spells, curses, and I would say hypnosis. It brings people under control. I've met many real practicing witches. Quite a number. One woman told me I've killed people by my curses was a respectable, middle-class American housewife. I've met several young people just recently, girls that have told me they could put a hex on somebody and make them do what they wanted. Sorcery operates through things like charms, music, dancing, and drugs. This craze for drugs is nothing new. The, American, the African witch doctor has known about it for centuries. They've long experimented in certain herbs and things that would produce certain strange conditions. And basically, the categorical name for that whole operation is sorcery. Bringing people into a supernatural state of power by the use of certain things like drugs, music, charms, so on. Be careful what you wear around your neck or put around your wrist. Because you can put on a satanic yoke if you put something that's supposed to have power. How many people seek protection 
by a charm or a lucky penny. Somebody told me about a girl who grew sick and her mother took her to a faith healer who gave the mother a little charm. said, put this around the girl's neck and it will keep her well. The mother did. The girl became well. But after some time, the mother became illuminated and realized the awful thing she'd done. They took the charm off, opened it up, and inside they read a little poem which said, Satan, keep this girl's body well till her soul burns in hell. The devil doesn't mind a little healing, provided it costs you your soul. He'll gladly call off a minor demon in order to enslave you with a major one. All right. I'm not going to go into the list in the New Testament because time is running out. Let me mention very quickly, you'll find many examples in the New Testament. Acts chapter 8 in Samaria, Simon the sorcerer, bewitched the whole city with his sorceries, had everybody enslaved by satanic supernatural power. And you see how hard it was for him to repent? He could believe the gospel, watch Philip, stay with him, get baptized, but there was something in his heart that was still after money. You remember the last things ever said to him? Thy heart is not right. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. Peter discerned his motives were still crooked. And I'll tell you, it's the hardest thing in the world for somebody that served Satan in this realm to get really free. It demands total repentance. No fooling around. No halfway commitment, but a total renunciation of Satan and a total submission to God. Typically enough, you know, the last thing Simon the sorcerer said, he said, pray for me. Oh, how typical. You do the work. You get desperate. I'll trust your prayers. People come to me, sometimes I say, brother, sister, you're wanting me to be desperate for you. I won't do it. You get desperate for yourself. Don't ask the preacher to do all the work. You start to get desperate. Dave Wilkerson says to the drug addict, if you're desperate... You can be delivered. That's true of almost every major area of deliverance. If you're desperate, you can get delivered. Don't ask the preacher to be desperate for you. Acts 13, a certain false prophet, a sorcerer named Bar Jesus, who sought to keep the preachers of the gospel from the Roman deputy in the island of Cyprus. See, that's the work of the enemy, to keep a man from the truth. There was an open, head-on conflict between Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, and the sorcerer. I wish I'd been there. If anything I wish I could have seen, it was there. Paul looked at that man and said, Thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, how long wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? You know what he was talking to? A sorcerer. A false prophet. What is a sorcerer? A child of the devil and an enemy of all righteousness. Acts 16 a damsel with a spirit of divination, the Greek says, with a spirit, a python, a fortune-telling girl. So successful that as a slave girl, she brought a lot of money to her masters. Now, you'll never bring a lot of money if you're never right. She must have been right many times. And when Paul and Silas came to that city, she knew who they were long before anybody else. She followed them every day in the street, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who show unto us the way of salvation. Every word she spoke was true, but she was a servant of the devil. Somebody said if Paul had been a modern missionary, he'd have made a charter member of the church in Philippi. <laughs> but he turned to that spirit, said, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And the scripture says, he came out of her the same hour. And she was no longer able to tell fortunes. Fortune telling is the demon of divination. Galatians 3, 1, O oh foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? You say they weren't saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit, you couldn't be more wrong, because the next verse says, Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law, the hearing of faith? Yes, they were good, charismatic Christians, but they were bewitched. Did you know that Spirit-baptized people can be bewitched? Believe me, they can. I took over a congregation that was bewitched by the wife of the previous pastor. I came face to face with that power at that time and I learned the truth about the Galatians. What was the evidence that they were bewitched? Galatians chapter 4. Ye observe times, days, months, years. You're playing with horoscopes. You're seeking to get to know the future by occult means. Paul said, I'm afraid lest I bestow labor upon you in vain. I think I've wasted my time preaching the gospel to you. Second Timothy chapter 3. In the last days, deceivers shall wax worse and worse. But the Greek word is magicians. 
I wish you'd notice that. 2 Timothy 3.13, where the King James says deceivers, the Greek says magicians. And these people are compared with Jannes and Jambres, the magicians who withstood Moses. Have you ever thought about the fact that the magicians of Egypt had supernatural power? Have you ever considered that? Moses threw down his rod, it became a serpent, and the magician said, we can do that. And they did it. The only difference was that Moses' snake ate up their snakes. The next one, Moses took water out of the river, turned it to blood. They said, we can do that, and did it. The third one, Moses called the frogs out. They filled the houses of the Egyptians. The magician said, wait a minute, we can do that too, and they did it. The fourth one, Moses turned the dust into lights. The Egyptians, magicians tried to do that and could not. Then they said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. This goes beyond us. You better listen to this man. He's got something we don't have. But they had supernatural power. And I'm setting notice on you that at the close of this age, the conflict is not going to be fought on the natural plane. It's going to be fought in the supernatural. Manifested supernatural power of Satan, confronted by and overcome by the manifested supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. You read Second Timothy chapter 3, it is very clear. Revelation chapter 9 verse and chapter 18, you'll find the references to witchcraft and particularly in connection with Babylon, the false religious situation. Now we've come to the time when we're going to have an opportunity for you to be delivered and set free. There are three things basically you have to do. Number one, if you've been involved in any of these things, heresies, departures from the Christian faith, or any form of satanic supernatural, and there's the list. I didn't read it out. So I read it out? Ouija boards, fortune-telling, ESP, drugs, including all sorts of medical drugs like pep tablets, painkillers, and sed sedation, and so on. Mediums, clairvoyance, meditation, oriental cults and philosophies, and I specify particularly yoga and the teaching of reincarnation, astrology, horoscopes, hypnotis, automatic writing, and graphoanalysis or handwriting analysis, and that's just a selection. If you have been involved in any of those things or anything like them, and you want to be clear, you want that dark shadow lifted off your life, you want that bondage taken away. Let me tell you this example quickly. I've got two minutes. I was talking to a man in Lexington, Kentucky, a Roman Catholic background, a nice, educated, successful businessman. I said to him, are you baptized in the Holy Spirit? He said, yes, but. And you know what the but is, don't you? But I don't speak in tongues. I said, another elephant without a trunk. Well, he said, I speak about two words, and then he said, I can't speak anymore. So I said to him, have you ever been to a fortune teller? Oh, he said, yes, when I was a boy, but it was just a joke. It didn't mean anything. But I said, you went. I said, would you be willing to confess that as a sin and renounce it? Well, one thing about the Catholics, they're good at confessing sins. So, well, he said, if you think it's of any consequence, I will. So I led him in a public confession and renunciation of the sin of going to a fortune teller. Now I said, start praying. And he prayed fluently in an unknown tongue, without any barrier. See, the barrier had been removed. How many times people tell me, Brother Prince, just when the power of God is strongest in the meeting, and I feel I'm reaching out to God and longing to worship Him, something comes between. And you know the first question I ask? Have you been to a fortune teller? And about twice out of three times, the answer is yes. Oh, but I was only a little girl when I went. Oh, I didn't mean it. It was just a joke. But you went. You went to a servant of Satan for help that should come only from God. And God in his mercy is not going to lift that pressure till you've come to the cause of it and seen what you did. Because it's essential that every child of God get clear about the dangers of occult involvement from this day onwards. That you'll never be fooled, never be tempted, never go back and get into that area again. Now, you want to be free, I'm going to tell you what to do. You confess as a sin the involvement, having your palm ring, playing with a Ouija board, consulting a fortune teller, reading books about Edgar Cayce, Gene Dixon, so on, many, many more. Secondly, you renounce it. By a deliberate act of your will, you dissociate yourself from it. The best words I can think of are those of the psalmist David. 
Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee, that's the whole satanic demonic realm, am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Is a Christian allowed to say that? Yes. Not about flesh and blood, because we don't war against flesh and blood, but against God's spiritual enemies. You have to say, I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. God will not deliver you from your friend. Why should he? But if you make them your enemy, he'll deliver you. All right. You confess, you renounce, and you break every contact. If you have a Ouija board, you burn it. If you have horoscopes, you burn them. If you have books in that category about transmigration of souls, yoga, all these things, you burn them. You do not leave anything in your house that leaves a chink open in the door for the devil to come back. There has to be a house cleaning for most Christians. In Acts 19, when the power of Satan was revealed and the believers saw what really was happening, it's a remarkable thing. It says, great fear came upon all, and many that believed, believers, came and confessed and showed their evil deeds. They'd been believers, but they'd been playing with the other side at the same time. And those that had books about the occult brought them and burned them. And the price was 50,000 pieces of silver, $50,000 worth of books burned. You cannot afford to keep it. Don't sell it. Don't pass it on. You poison somebody else. Destroy it. It's the only thing. And if you don't destroy it, your deliverance will not be complete or permanent. A woman at Tokoa, Georgia, in one of these camps came to me. Uh, her case was tragic. It was pathetic. I cannot describe it in detail. But she'd been a practitioner of the occult for about nine years. She came for deliverance, fearing suicide. My wife and I ministered to her. She received partial deliverance. I said, have you got books at home? She said, oh, I've got so many. She said, they're worth eight or nine thousand dollars. I said, burn them. But she said, they're worth eight or nine thousand dollars. I said, how much is your soul worth? And I never know to this day whether she burned them or not. She said, will I be set free? I said, if you burn them, yes. But God will keep you on the hook in his mercy till you've burned them. Many times he does that. You cannot fool God, nor can you fool the devil. Don't try. Each of them knows when you mean business. The key word for most people today is repent. Stop fooling around and playing church and being a little religious and get desperate. Make a decision. All right. Now, I think in all fairness, what I'm going to do is give everybody here an opportunity to be disassociated from the occult. And when I've done that, if you wish to leave, you may do so. You'll have time to get to the next meeting. And then if there are those who know that beyond dissociating themselves from the occult, they need actual deliverance, then you'll have to stay. I'm not inviting anybody to stay. I'd rather see you leave. But I don't want to turn you away if... You desire deliverance. And several people have come to me and said, well, I didn't get delivered yesterday. I said, come back today. So I'm not going to refuse them. But if you know that you're clear, as soon as we've said this one renunciatory prayer, please leave and go to the next meeting. I don't want to keep anybody from the next speaker. Would you stand to your feet? Now, I am not... Yes, I am. I'm going to ask you to do one thing. If, in listening to me this afternoon, you stand here and realize that in some way you've been involved with this satanic supernatural and you have never dealt with the problem, you've never renounced it, you've never made a clean break until now, but you now desire to do so, I want you to do one thing. Raise your hand. Right. Anyway, you desire to make this break. God bless you. Okay, now those of you that said it, that raised your hands, I want you to say this out loud after me. And when you've said it, turn loose. If anything comes out, let it come. I don't know what could happen here in the next few minutes, but let it go. And if you are fearful, just remember that if you're respectful, obedient, cooperative, nothing can harm you. In the name of Jesus, I bind every demonic power that's here, and I demand that they leave without hurting any person or without hurting others. 
And I claim the protection of the blood of Jesus over the families and relatives and friends and associations of all that are here in Jesus' name. All right, now you say this. Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ I believe that you are the Son of God, the Messiah, the Messiah who came in the flesh. Who came in the flesh. You, died on the you died on the cross for my sins. And you rose again from the dead. And you rose again from the dead. I now confess all my sins. I repent of all my sins. I repent of all my sins. In particular, I confess. In particular, I confess. Seeking to Satan. Seeking to Satan. For help that should come only from God. For help that should come only from God. I confess as a sin. I confess as a sin. Now name the thing. Fortune telling, Ouija board, whatever it is. Say your own particular sin. Anything that the Spirit of God now brings to you, say, I confess as a sin. Lord, I now renounce that. I renounce Satan and all his works. I hate his demons. I count them my enemy. In the name of Jesus, I loose myself now evil influence from every satanic bondage from any spirit in me that is not the spirit of God and I command all such spirits to leave me now in the name of Jesus now let them go Satan I bind your power and command you to loose these people and come out from them now in Jesus name Every spirit of divination, sorcery, witchcraft, I bind your power in the name of Jesus, and I command you to loose these people and depart from them and from this place in Jesus' mighty name through the power of the blood of the cross. In the name of Jesus, Satan, be loosed, be cast out in Jesus' mighty name. <laughs> now if you know that the contact is broken and you are free please leave and go to the next meeting <laughs>